to, uh, to be with you uh, today. Um, old haunts, Cambridge, Massachusetts, although my haunts were at another institution in this fine city. Um, and um, I, uh, I am very fond of saying that uh, to audiences that uh, my research combines uh, what I think are the two least controversial areas of science in American society, evolution and climate change. Um, I, I get a variety of uh, responses to that when I say it to, um, in Washington, D.C., to politically interested audiences, but I appreciate those who laughed. Um, uh, the, uh, the subject of human origins, human evolution, which is uh, my area of, uh, of study, is uh, an area that, uh, that connects the, the personal to the history of life on the planet. It connects the universals of uh, the process, the evolutionary heritage uh, that we all share uh, with the, uh, the intimacy of our experience in being human. And I hope to give you uh, one or two examples uh, of that over the, the course of this, uh, of, of my talk. Um, the, um, get this going here. Oh, I have to direct it at the computer. How about <laughs> that as directing it to the computer? <laughs> <laughs> Direct connection. Um, the, um, about 20 or 30 years ago, if you were to ask any paleoanthropologist, any student of human evolution, uh, what the main topic was, what the main focus, the, the, the idea, of human evolution, it might come out something like this, that somehow there was the solving of this dilemma that you see. The dilemma of um, in a, uh, a widening savanna grassland uh, in Africa, how uh, the human lineage, early human ancestors in this case, were able to overcome the challenges of that specific habitat and the idea of domination or mastering that habitat was thought to lead to all things human. I began uh, my research in East Africa with that kind of idea, that mentality. I didn't really question it uh, much, uh, but I did come to question it. And I, I came to question it in terms of really trying to understand much more specifically how one goes in terms of the narrative of human evolution and the explanatory framework from solving this kind of challenge to solving that kind of challenge. Uh, one in which humans have wrapped themselves in a cocoon of technology and sociality, complexity, um, that allow, has allowed us to um, do remarkable things um, and uh, to, uh, to evolve those capacities of, of culture um, that, uh, that enable uh, such a transition. And it struck me eventually, not at first, but it struck me eventually that rather than a discordance, a disharmony, a dissonance of who we are today from our evolutionary past, that actually our evolutionary past could help us to explain the origins of the adaptability and resilience of the human species that would lead to putting ourselves into difficult situations uh, epitomized, symbolized um, by, by that uh, photo of uh, Ed White taking a, the first uh, spacewalk. And so uh, let me just give you a quick overview of what I'd like to do. Um, I know many of you do not have a necessarily a comprehensive uh, background in the study of human evolution. So I'll give you a quick synopsis of some aspects of uh, the major features of human evolution. I'd like to present a new model of African climate dynamics. Last night at four in the morning, I submitted a revised manuscript to the Journal of Human Evolution about this. Uh, climate dynamics uh, model. It's, it's the climate dynamics themselves are not new, but the um, 
but the application to evolutionary questions uh, is. And so I'd like to lay that out and, and explore um, certain events, uh, critical events in uh, human evolutionary history, uh, milestones of uh, adaptation and dispersal, and uh, the uh, first appearance uh, evidence that we have of uh, the major lineages uh, in our evolutionary history and how they relate, link to prolonged periods of climate variability, high climate variability. And then uh, finish up with some perspectives on the, uh, the concept of the Anthropocene, which I, as I understand it has been a, a theme that has run through uh, some of the discussions uh, here in this, uh, in this lecture series. Well, first of all, this is wrong. Um, this is an iconic view of, uh, of human evolution that prevailed uh, through much of the 20th century. Um, and it is an idea of a single line of linear progress through time, one species after another, leading from a, an ape-like uh, creature to, uh, to human beings today. I'm sure you're all familiar with the various cultural manifestations of this in advertising and things like this. My, my favorite in, in, uh, in that realm is, is this one, um, <laughs> where um, you know, it gets used for all sorts of purposes. And actually, now that I think of it, probably because I've shown a picture of beer, you'll probably remember this slide of all the other ones that I show. But in any case, it is certainly part of our um, our mentality um, in Western society, certainly, to think in terms of these uh, linear uh, lines of, uh, of, of progress as, as an aspect of, of evolution. We know that's not, uh, that's not true based on the uh, relatively rich fossil record compared with um, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, certainly. Uh, about 100 years ago, we knew a couple of dozen uh, fossils. Uh, related to the human evolutionary uh, picture. Uh, most of them belong to the famed group known as Neanderthals uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and um, uh, as a result of uh, many fossil discoveries, there are now about um, 6,000 fossil individuals of uh, early hominins, uh, human ancestors and relatives that are known, uh, applicable to our, uh, that help us understand our evolutionary history. That may not sound like much, but for a large bodied vertebrate, that's actually not bad. Um, and then when you couple that with tens of thousands of archeological sites, which are the markers of behavior, a, uh, if you were a paleontologist, you might call them ichnofossils, things that are left by traces of behavior that are left behind. Um, it really is in a very extraordinary record of, um, particularly over the last two and a half million years, of uh, the behavioral changes over time, the calling cards of stone tools that are virtually indestructible, that are left in the fossil record, the, the stratigraphic record that says, I was here. Um, and helps us understand aspects of the uh, presence of early humans um, through stratigraphic levels and, of course, it's just the dispersal of those ancestors uh, over time and space. Um, and so we are the, um, the last remaining um, species of a, uh, once of a diverse uh, evolutionary tree. Uh, four major groups, the rather mysterious, what I call Artipithecus group, between six or perhaps back to seven million years with this species down here, Selhalanthropus, known from Chad. Uh, a, a very fine skeleton known as Artipithecus ramidus, uh, that's uh, known here at about 4.4 4 .4 million years ago. You then have the evolutionary group of Australopithecus, again, uh, Africa, uh, African in, uh, in origin and its, and its entire distribution, uh, characterized by relatively small body size, um, relatively short legs and long, powerful arms, but certainly bipedal, uh, walking upright on two legs. Anything that has evidence of walking upright on, a, uh, uh, on two legs, um, and small canine teeth in both sexes, males and females. Those are the two uh, first indicators of something that belongs in our evolutionary history uh, among all the uh, great apes. 
Um, and so uh, Australopithecus uh, certainly had the, retained the capacity for climbing trees, uh, but also uh, walked upright uh, in a very effective and efficient manner. Uh, the Paranthropus group, uh, the division of splitting into a Paranthropus group and the group of uh, Homo which, to which we belong to, the Paranthropus group I kind of think of as the eating machines in our evolutionary history. Large, powerful jaws and broad teeth uh, that were capable of uh, pretty much eating anything that they put in their mouths, but they had to um, exercise that whole machinery. Uh, that whole complex, um, which took a lot of energy to grow and to, uh, to move the whole muscles, whether they were eating very hard or, or coarse uh, materials or whether they were eating soft berries. But they were able to do a lot with that, the nature of that adaptability, if you will. Um, the, another approach to it, though, however, was grow a large brain. Um, you can't put your energy of life into everything. And so at a great cost, because brains are very energetically expensive, uh, there is the group, uh, the homo group, the, to which we belong, that, um, that invested its energy into um, the plasticity of, of large brains, of uh, increased uh, um, brains and greater connectivity of uh, white matter. Uh, in, uh, in the, the neocortex and its projections to other parts of the brain. Um, oops, sorry. I'm doing the wrong one. Uh, we also have a great deal of evidence of the long-term accumulation of human qualities. Again, this largely comes from the uh, archaeological record, uh, where we see, uh, for example, um, these oldest known um, set of uh, footprints, uh, 3.6 million years old from a uh, site uh, that Mary Leakey and her team worked in the 1970s. Uh, three individuals uh, walking upright on, uh, on their two legs um, across a, a, volcanic, uh, a volcanic plain where it was raining and the, the carbon, uh, carbonatite volcanic a material that had, had been uh, laying over the, uh, the surface of this area of northern Tanzania uh, interacted with the water and basically became cement. And so that's why those footprints are preserved along with the ecosystem of other animals and their footprints. Even fossilized raindrops uh, in, uh, in this, um, uh, this layer of volcanic uh, ash. Uh, two and a half million years, just of a select uh, few of uh, fossil skulls representing uh, Australopithecus and, and early members of the genus Homo to our own species. Our own species is the only mammal that has its face uh, positioned directly uh, beneath uh, the front part of its, uh, the frontal lobe of the brain. Um, that's one of the distinctive characteristics of uh, recognizing a skull of Homo sapiens, where all the earlier ones had the face, in a sense, hafted on to the front uh, of, the, uh, of the brain case. Uh, but you can see in the, just these few skulls the changes in brain size, uh, cranial capacity at least, and, uh, and also the size of the face. Um, two and a half or 2.6 million years of technology in just a few uh, objects uh, there. Old, early Oldowan technology, stone flaking in its simplest form, the manufacture of uh, hand axes that began about one and three quarter million years ago. Uh, and then um, at around 90,000 years ago, I just happened to put in there the world's uh, oldest uh, specialized fishing implements used for catching catfish uh, from, uh, uh, from Congo, from the Congo. Um, and then um, evidence of the creativity and the, um, the roots of human imagination. Uh, a, uh, this is one of my favorite archaeological objects. There's a, a several dozen of these from an archaeological site in Zambia called Twin Rivers. And these are what I like to call the world's oldest crayons. Um, they're, they don't exactly fit into a pack of 64, but um, like Crayolas do, but nonetheless, they're, they're very chunky, but they have the same kind of facets on these pieces of ochre, coloring material of orange and red, red ochre. And then uh, one of the world's oldest pieces of representational art uh, from a, um, a site in um, uh, Zimbabwe uh, and called Apollo 11 Cave. Um, and uh, you can kind of make out there that there's uh, kind of a, uh, an animal form, but basically on legs that look like they're bipedal, like a, like a human, like human legs. 
So these, um, the beginnings of imagination, the, with the putting together of um, or, uh, uh, organic forms that don't exist in nature but come out of the human imagination. And so we have a quite a good timeline uh, that's ro been quite robust with regard to the last 20, 30, 40 years of uh, discovery. Uh, but the timeline improved um, back to six million years of a variety of things. So we have moving through time from bottom to, uh, to top. Uh, most of my work is as a geologist, so I do uh, think stratigraphically about these things from bottom to top. Uh, so going from uh, bipedal walking and tree climbing for um, about four million years ago until there was a really a, um, a loss, if you will, a giving up of um, those that propensity to climb trees in specialized ways, having specialized uh, morphology of the upper limbs to do that, and a devotion to long distance bipedal walking, increased range of foods eaten seen from microware studies of, uh, of teeth as well as isotopic studies uh, of the teeth of fossil humans, a simple stone flaking by 2.6 million years ago, extensive carrying of stones and food by about 2.1 or 2 million years ago, uh, elongation of the legs in this time range. Uh, it's also the time range in which we see the earliest dispersal uh, beyond the African uh, continent. Uh, advances in stone technology with hand axes. The most rapid increase in relative brain size is actually quite late. Yes, there were increases in brain size down here, but those were um, also accompanied by pretty important increases in body size. But independent of body size, the most rapid increase in relative brain size occurred over the last 800,000 years. Uh, control of fire. Uh, by about 800,000 years ago, uh, there was a paper published this summer that suggests in uh, a site in South Africa where that may go back to a little bit older than 900,000 years ago, but we have early hearths at 800,000 years ago, a site in Israel, 400,000 years ago, building shelters, complex spatial mapping and resource exchange. I'll talk a little bit about that um, later on at about 250,000 years as well as enhanced symbolic uh, behavior, and then especially over the last 100,000 years ago, increased uh, cultural diversity, the um, uh, diversification of the options of what it means to be a human being in a cultural, uh, cultural sense. Um, and so that's a, a basic outline of, um, of the uh, adaptive history, if you will, of uh, human origins. Now, uh, again, um, if, you, um, if you talked with any paleoanthropologist uh, 30 uh, years ago, uh, the idea that they would say about um, the environmental history of human evolution was the savanna hypothesis, that is, with regard to uh, Africa. Yes, there were many people who are still talking about ice age, uh, the ice ages in, in higher latitudes as being important, uh, selective pressures with regard to um, um, the evolution of human cognition and so on, but it, it's this that has largely prevailed throughout um, the study of human evolution. And the idea here is that if you, all you had to do is to put early humans out on this uh, opening savanna grassland of East Africa, and that was just the stage. And f on that stage, there was an, a cascade of all things human. You didn't have to really talk about the environmental dynamics of that savanna very much. Uh, all you had to do is to say, well, walking upright between patches of trees and getting out onto the grassland, uh, seeing over tall grass was important. And from that, it freed the hands, tool making, expanded the diet, hunting, use of fire and tools, large brain, complex social life, uh, language, and so on, where one adaptation essentially set the stage for the emergence of the other adaptation kind of an intrinsic history, an internal history of human evolution as opposed to one that looks to the relationship to the environment. Question, sir? I'm uh, just wondering when the opposable thumb first appeared, how long did that? Uh, opposable thumb actually is a characteristic of primates in general. Um, so back to uh, certainly well documented in skeletons going back to 55 million uh, years ago uh, along with uh, thumbnails. Uh, showing uh, the ability to grasp. An opposable thumb like ours, uh, whereby we might think that it's the thumb that elongated. No, it's actually the other digits that decreased in size. Um, and, uh, and so that we have very good evidence of 
easily by, well, hand fossils are a little hard to come by, but by about 3.5, 3.4 million years ago, we have really good fossil hands, um, skeletons, uh, in the record that shows that that had already occurred. Uh, and setting the stage, of course, for the ability to uh, do very fine precision stone flaking, which even the earliest stone flaking um, shows, um, the ability to modify rocks in a very precise way. Um, and so my, um, my excursion into uh, the environmental history of human origins um, really started here in the, in the Rift Valley of southern Kenya at a site with their fairly unpronounceable name of Alorgus Sile, where I continue, uh, I continue to work. And uh, so I've been working there for about, well, since 1985. Uh, you can see my, my home away from home, a set of tents up there on that ridge. And you can see this layer after layer stratigraphic uh, uh, record of environmental change, rich in fossils uh, and stone artifacts. Uh, where one can look at the relationship between these uh, fundamental pieces of evidence about human evolutionary history, changes in technology, changes in behavior, and uh, changes in the biota that were occurring um, over, uh, over time. The uh, argon-argon uh, uh, radiometric ages uh, at this site go back to 1.2 million years ago. It's the best, most precisely dated site. Uh, in the world for the last 1.2 million years that's rich in archaeological uh, remains and fossil remains of, uh, of, of animals. Um, and so this became kind of my uh, laboratory every summer uh, to explore with a, a, a great team of environmental scientists, geologists, uh, geophysicists, and uh, paleontologists, archaeologists, all those ologists that you heard of. Um, just of, uh, examples of the variety of things that we find, stone hand axes, a t tremendous amount of stone hand axes in the time period between 1.2 million and 500,000 years ago. These are not the earliest stone hand axes, which as I mentioned previously go back to one and three quarter million years ago in East Africa. Uh, but it's one of the most famous stone hand axe sites in the world, the site of Alorgus Sile. Uh, really great evidence of uh, fossil uh, animals uh, in this time range. These large-bodied grazers, I think of them as the, um, uh, the large lawnmowers of the Pleistocene. They ate grass and they ate it abundantly. They were specialized grazers. They were animals of the savanna but they did not last, which was one of the first things to indicate that, hmm, what's going on with the Savannah hypothesis that they didn't last? And after uh, 62 years of going back to the, uh, the elder Leakeys, Lewis and Mary Leakey, who first worked here in uh, 1942, and a whole series of surveys and so on uh, at this particular site, uh, in 2003, uh, we found this uh, fossil human. No other fossil humans had been found there, and we figured out kind of why. They left tens of thousands of, again, their calling cards in the lowland basin, and they were extremely good at finding ways of not becoming fossils. And one of the ways that we realized what was going on is that they were using the highlands to get their stone tools, to get the stone material for making tools, the volcanic highlands. And they would come down into the lowlands, do their foraging activity. And if you really don't want to become a fossil, you don't get killed. And a great place to get killed is in the lowlands at night, right by the water's edge, which is where all these other fossil animals were meeting their demise. Um, and uh, so we went to the place, you couldn't find them up in the highlands, there's no natural burial there, but in the first year of searching these volcanic ridges that came down to the lowlands and finding the places where sediment came into them, in that first year we found this fossil human and we continued to use that as a strategy for finding fossil humans. But um, this was, uh, this little, this is a brow ridge right here, the eye sockets are looking at you. Bits and pieces of the brain case were also found uh, of, a, um, of Homo erectus, that's the species that it belongs to. Um, so anyway, a lot of our time has been spent scouring the hillsides, digging geological trenches, putting together the record, the environmental history of uh, Olorga Sile. And uh, each hillside, of course, represents a slice of time. In this particular case, these hillsides right in here, uh, there's an argon-argon date for a volcanic um, uh, tephra 
uh, down here, uh, dated at about right about one million years ago, uh, 1.02 million, and at the top of about 990,000 years ago, so about 10,000 years of time represented here. And I remember going up and down this hillside in 1985, my first time going out to explore the savanna hypothesis. And in digging a geological trench, uh, there our team uh, uh, dug and doing through a variety of things like pollen and uh, stable isotopic work eventually and uh, looking at the diatoms and the diatomites, we could see actually that there was this back and forth going on between dry and wet, including volcanic eruptions that would kill off all the grass in the uh, um, uh, previous, uh, previously deposited layer um, from a from that going to a deep lake, going to a drought and evaporate horizon, probably representing about 500 years, back to a deep lake that extended as far as the eye could see uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the Alorgus Isle Basin and lapping over into the, uh, the edges of the, uh, of the Rift Valley. Uh, in this. And so it dawned on me that, you know, maybe it's not like one single environment that was critical in human evolutionary history. Everyone was talking about the preferred environment of, human, of early humans. And the more I kept thinking about this, the more I kept thinking, could it be something about the variability of the environment that was of interest in understanding human evolutionary history? Well, so in the early 1990s, I began to retool myself in the environmental sciences. I am an, inv an invader of that field or those fields of, uh, of work, but I try my best to render it to my colleagues in the field of paleoanthropology and related fields. Um, and of course, one of the iconic diagrams, um, this is from 10 million years to present, uh, from uh, right to left, is the um, uh, Delta 18O. Uh, record of uh, benthic foraminifera. Um, this record can, of course, be extended back. And yes, there are sample size differences here that are uh, perhaps responsible for some aspects of the variability here. But the overall record here, when everyone else was trying to say that, OK, look, the Earth is getting um, cooler over time, more ice age fluctuations, I kept seeing the variability. So what other people were saying were no was noise, I kept th thinking, well, could it be a signal that's important in human evolutionary history? Um, so beginning six million years ago, just looking at this, the cold warm fluctuation becomes more dramatic. Three million years ago, uh, approximately, uh, glacial fluctuations. And then the strongest fluctuations occurred while the genus Homo was uh, evolving. And um, I thought that really made my head scratch and again wonder whether in fact the variability may be an important aspect of natural selection uh, in, uh, the, over the course of human origins and, and also you would expect of other contemporaneous organisms. Well, that has been the iconic diagram for uh, world ocean um, environmental uh, picture or the, the environmental picture that's, uh, that the world's ocean uh, give, but we have learned a lot more about African climate variability over the last 15 to 20 years. And since so much of human evolutionary history is focused in Africa, that's been very much the focus of, of my own um, research and that of my, uh, my colleagues. And so I'm sure you're all familiar with this aspects of three uh, major parameters of uh, Earth's orbital change, um, eccentricity, the shape of the Earth's orbit around the sun, uh, tilt uh, or obliquity in the axis of the Earth's uh, um, uh, 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 rotation, and precession, the wobble uh, in the Earth's axis of rotation. And it's really from a, the interaction of those um, that uh, we can look specifically at um, a framework for African climate variability. African climate, as is all climate, is influenced by variation in solar uh, insulation. And the main variation is due to the interaction in Africa uh, of orbital precession modulated by eccentricity with precession being on approximately, uh, uh, well, two cycles of approximately 19 and 23,000 years, eccentricity approximately 100,000 and 413,000 year cycles. Um, that's is somewhat of a of simplification of the actual, uh, actual picture, but it allows us to play with these things such that the interaction of essentially four sine waves, 
essentially four, and four sine waves gives a pattern that looks like this. The interaction gives this pattern of alternating phases of high and low climate variability in tropical Africa, where you can see higher, this is the precessional index, a higher index uh, here, followed by a lower index here, higher, lower, that is essentially um, uh, determined by uh, eccentricity, by values for eccentricity over, uh, over time. And so putting this together um, and using a value for eccentricity that's one standard deviation uh, below mean eccentricity for the last five million years, um, we were able to, my colleagues and I were able to develop a predictive framework of when in Africa, for, particularly for tropical East Africa, when there would be periods of relatively low and relatively higher um, variability. And this, of course, is variability in moisture. And, and that's basically generated by, um, by seasonality. And in the uh, paper that we've, um, are just, that's just about to come out, hopefully within the next couple months, um, a period of uh, or a, this alternating low and high variability, we give a numbering system uh, back to 5 million years, 32 uh, intervals of high climate variability interspersed with th 31 uh, periods of low climate variability. Um, essentially, what this sh allows us to do is to look at regional records of um, East African and Northeast African uh, climate variability and see whether the standard deviations or the variance agrees with this model, and it agrees beautifully. And so, for example, one can look at um, aeolian dust blown into the, off the coast of East Africa and the variance in East African dust at these different time markers predicting high and low climate variability. And it agrees really, really beautifully with, with that. Also, the Sapropel record five million years of tropical African moisture and aridity. Sapropels are these uh, dark layers that are interspersed with uh, dark layers that are organic rich, showing basically the flooding of the Nile Basin, basically the uh, northeastern quadrant of the African continent, and very heavy monsoons there, flooding into the uh, Mediterranean, creating a stratification of water, which produces a lot of organics in the upper part of the water column, which then sink to the bottom, forming organic rich layers, and during dry times forming um, lighter bands, beige bands, uh, that do not show as, as much uh, as, uh, of organic material in them. And what we've also been able to see is that the um, nature of these layers um, have periods of relative stability and relative instability in them, supporting this idea of uh, packets. And this was the uh, damn slide that we were trying to get to work right. Um, <laughs> Um, but in any case, one, this is a um, spectral reflectance in the Sapropel uh, record, basically a, uh, uh, the, showing the color variation back to about three million uh, years ago. And one can see these periods of high, alternating high and low variability. And if you look at the data for um, all of this record, uh, the periods of transition between high and low variability uh, matches um, that of the predictive model um, to a very, very great extent of high statistical significance of the correlation of the change in eccentricity with the change in variance of the um, Sapropel record. What's going on here is that if you look from zero to 150,000 years ago, is that the periods of low variability have a fairly stable relationship, fairly stable relationship between winter and summer or between uh, rainy and dry uh, season variability. So the seasonality is uh, quite stable as opposed to times of high variability where the difference between summer and winter or between rainy and dry becomes uh, very, very similar seasonality to very, very different. So times of low seasonality to times of high seasonality essentially define those intervals of high climate variability. So putting all of this, all of this together um, has made me wonder, and actually before this, uh, wondering about 
well, what could be this fate of lineages, of gene pools, of populations uh, in a uh, sort of a, a model of climate, high climate variability over time, which would either be warm, cold, or more moist, dry. And we basically have three possible fates. One is not the best uh, for an organism, is that it becomes extinct. It's not able to track these, uh, these thin lines or the ability to track these environmental changes. The population cannot track those, popula those uh, environmental changes very well across space following its favorite environment. It becomes extinct. Uh, most organisms are habitat specific. They have a particular combination of diet and um, temperature or rainfall conditions under which they must live and therefore their ability to move to track environmental change is cr absolutely critical to their ability to, uh, to survive, uh, to basically moving. But then I wondered, well, is there some way in which this envelope of adaptability could expand over time? Yes, there can be this moving back and forth with environmental change, but once the envelope of adaptability of becoming more versatile um, uh, is increased, that there can be the ability to move independently of these um, climate and environmental and ecological changes. And so I began to think about that, and eventually I came up with, and this was going actually some, far, uh, some way back, a perspective that I published in Science in 1996 in a book that came out that same year of what I called variability selection, where the variability is not the selection of phenotypic variation, but rather it's the variability itself as the selecting agent, uh, whereby in a time of high climate variability, as represented here in one of the high climate variability intervals that we've just defined in the publication, that uh, there is this change in landscape between wetter and drier, and that the gene pool would favor um, at different times changes toward um, uh, essentially a genotype that would succeed in a template of wetter in conditions, but then drier conditions, wetter conditions, drier conditions. But if there was the kind of genetic variability that allowed the organism to become more plastic, to become more, to have behaviors that were better at adjusting to the environmental change, that those would win out in a prolonged period of high climate variability going for through, uh, through, through time. And so it's that adaptable uh, phenotype and its ge underlying genetic basis that would ultimately uh, win out in that situation. And so I defined it as a process by which combinations of genes are favored, increased in the gene pool, as we just saw in that conceptual model, due to the instability in the survival conditions over time. Uh, and the resulting adaptations enlarge the options available to the organisms, the way in which a, a population, eventually its species, uses its surroundings. In a sense, this would be adaptation to novelty, to change itself. In other words, it would be adaptation to a past history of environmental dynamics, okay? It's not something that an organism is trying to think about what environment will come and can predict it, but rather it's this past history of environmental dynamics that instantiates in an organism through it in its gene pool this plasticity that allows it to adjust when there are um, future environmental insults and periods of instability. And this is possible because environmental variability occurs at all time scales. It's not at this grand geological time scale that I'm talking about it, but it's really at all time scales, from micro, uh, microseconds up through orbital time scales. As I showed in that slide a few slides back, that there's a strong relationship between seasonal variability um, experienced by individual organisms and its population to orbital time scales over which gene pools also persist. And this ability to, to adjust to the variability, to the change in variance, tempo, the predictability of, the envi of environments may be found at diverse biological levels, from genomic uh, organization to physiology, individual behavior, uh, the socioecology of an organism, as well as its lineage history. And so that's the, the idea behind variability selection and how it works. Now, probably the most disappointing um, aspect of all of this is that in a paper in 1998, I 
called upon anyone who is out there listening in computational biology or experimental biology that you might want to try to do some experiments about this to see if it's at all feasible. Does it, does it actually work? And um, it took about 20 years uh, for, not quite 20 years, but about 15 years for anyone to really do anything particularly substantive in this area. Um, and some of these were done totally independent of my suggestion of variability selection. Uh, but in um, uh, Arabidopsis, a uh, relative within the, well, it's within the mustard family of plants, one path to adaptability that alleles at different loci are expressed or suppressed in different environments. Uh, gene regulation is absolutely critical uh, in, this, uh, in terms of what gets expressed within the genotype. And this is also something that ex happens to be expected in the lineage of, uh, of Homo sapiens, gene uh, genetic um, regulation is absolutely critical in our distinction from our closest living uh, biological relatives, chimpanzees and other great apes. Um, there have been some uh, adventures in experimental evolution that have been done uh, by colleagues at, uh, at Rutgers working with C. elegans. Um, that lab populations um, that uh, encountered uh, temperature extremes at irregular intervals. This was an, a variability selection experiment and designed as it. They were able ultimately to be better adapted to novel temperatures than organisms that were directionally selected in the direction of that novel temperature. So it's, it does, did suggest that in these initial experiments that the variability of the environment was able somehow to instill in these nematodes the genetic capacity to adjust to novel settings. Yes, sir? Uh, so far, you haven't uh, shown an example uh, where there is a significant developmental phase, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, growth, the difference between immature and mature uh, states. And uh, most of the changes uh, in organisms like humans are actually in the developmental phase. Right. And that's the most of the that is a relatively short period of time and not subject to environmental changes because you're shielded by Right. Yeah, so there's a big difference there. Yeah, the, the, yeah there's a big difference in the scale of time, I think, is what you're trying to trying the adults, to. Adults uh, are already more uh, informed. I don't think that adult people or most other higher animals uh, have, uh, have their genes switching on and off. Uh, as a primary means of adapting to their environment. Right, that's, that, that, that's correct. I would totally agree with that. What's interesting with regard to human beings um, is that um, we have of any organism for its body size um, the most prolonged period of development and the plasticity is actually um, uh, expressed through the ability of the plasticity of neurons, mm -hmm. for example, and, and social interactions. Um, and that I would see as being the critical developmental phase in humans, whereby that capacity to prolong that period of growing up was of um, great selective value. It came as, as, at a tremendous evolutionary cost. Yeah. The ability to grow, to, to delay that period of growth or to prolong that period of growth through a very long period of immaturity, demanding an immense amount of energy from adults to help that individual grow up um, with, um, and also having a large brain, an incredibly expensive organ to maintain. A baby has, a two year old has, uh, it's uh, about 65% of its resting metabolism just from its brain, and it's only 2% of the body weight, that's not a good deal. But that plasticity is really, really important. And that plasticity in a social context is absolutely critical. So what I'm saying here is not that these particular model organisms um, replicate aspects of human evolutionary history, particularly the developmental history, but that the idea that organisms as a general phenomenon can actually respond to changes in the variability is the point of these experiments. Um, and also in, uh, in rotifers, uh, highly variable environments, and so on. So there are, there are some experimental um, uh, evidence uh, that organisms can actually undergo um, through periods of actually lower competitive fitness in specific environments as long as they can maintain genetically some ability to adjust with 
ti in time periods of greater variability or greater spatial heterogeneity of, uh, of habitats. Uh, there has also been some computational uh, bio biological modeling uh, that have been uh, done, particularly by this uh, fellow in, uh, in London, Matt Grove, um, whereby he looked at uh, basically the, um, uh, the variability selection conceptual model that I showed. Um, and um, showed that over a period of time using the oxygen isotope curve that a versatilist allele would outcompete the, even, uh, the, the cold specialist and the warm specialist even though uh, the cold and the warm specialist would have um, competitive advantages in any one given environment. Um, again, I don't know to what extent this is uh, particularly uh, valid, but there is a group at Michigan State University that's now doing a whole lot of computational biology on variability selection, and it'll be interesting to see what they, uh, they come up with. In any case, um, what I feel that I've been able to do in all of this is to keep working and plugging away at those early human sites and developing this, co this, um, uh, this climate variability model to see how good of a prediction it is of things that go on in human evolutionary history. This shows, again, this alternating high and low climate variability model. These are the time periods for, it, for these particular alternating periods. This the entire um, uh, this slide shows from about 2.9 million years ago to about 1.7 million years ago. And you'll see that there are these particularly prolonged periods of high climate variability that come out of this model. And, um, and we wonder, well, what actually goes on during those time periods? And it turns out that in that oldest time period, starting at about 2.6 million years ago, we have the oldest expression of Oldowan technology. Um, and we would interpret that, the emergence of that during this period of high climate variability, changes in seasonality, prolonged periods of, of disparity in environmental conditions, that the stone flaking basically increases the range of accessible foods. The ability to transport stone and food to archaeological sites was able to buffer changes in the spatial locations and abundance of food items as they were um, changing over the course of changes in seasonality and these longer periods of environmental change that were generated. And that access to meat and fat and a diversification of food resources was possible through the making of stone tools. And this helped offset habitat and resource instability. The basic Oldowan toolkit is a hammer stone, a stone that you strike like these, creating a pattern of, of scarring on them, and the sharp stone flakes that fly off. And with that basic ability to modify a rock, all the food resources of the African woodlands and savanna and all those variety of environments opened up. A hammer stone can crush better than an elephant's molar, more effectively from an engineering sense. And a, a sharp stone flake can cut better than a lion's canine or carnassial tooth. And so the ability to um, to have those cutting and pounding and crushing functions uh, opened up a whole variety of foods to those early uh, stone tool makers. Around 2 million, 2.1 million years ago in that second period of prolonged climate variability, we have, as demonstrated in our ec own excavations in uh, western Kenya, uh, we have this simple Oldowan toolkit of hammer stones, flakes, and cores. But we all also have, by 2.1 million years ago, in that prolonged period of high climate variability, the oldest evidence of persistent hunting of small animals. Uh, and uh, a diet rich in meat and in tubers. We know about the tubers because of the microscopic wear on the edges of the stone tools, showing that has only been able to be replicated by stripping of underground roots and tubers, and the interaction of not only the skins or the rinds of those tubers, but also the sediment itself that creates a polish on the edges of those stone tools. And we see carrying of food, of especially stones, of up to eight, eight miles away, 12 kilometers away, which is much longer than people thought that Oldowan toolmakers would be uh, carrying stones around in terms of total distance of, uh, of transport. 
And then in the, that third period of high climate variability, uh, between about 1.9 and 1.7 million years ago, we see the earliest dispersal of the genus Homo uh, across the um, uh, much of the, uh, the old world. Um, the emergence by 1.85 million years ago at the site of Dibanisi in the Republic of Georgia. My work in China with a tremendous uh, group of uh, uh, colleagues from the Institute of Geology and Geophysics uh, in Beijing, uh, showing that by 1.7, 1.71 million years ago, um, the um, a presence of early humans uh, of, of Homo erectus uh, in East Asia and spreading by 1.66 million years ago from 40 degrees north latitude to 7 degrees south latitude across an amazing diversity of uh, biotic zones and, 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 and climate um, uh, zones. Uh, we also have within the Neowon a fantastic pollen record that shows tremendous variation from nearly 100% uh, wooded uh, uh, tree uh, landscapes to 60% uh, grassland uh, landscapes with archaeological levels in all of these uh, different habitats, suggestive of this uh, increased adaptability. Uh, compared with earlier hominins, their ability to invade uh, different environments than what had previously been possible. And so, with regard to these long, these uh, this alternating period of all alternating high and low climate variability. Um, what I thought would be interesting to do is to take the 25% most prolonged periods with the idea that variability selection would need a prolonged period to assemble those gene combinations, prolonged period of high climate variability uh, to assemble those gene combinations that would uh, elicit or um, uh, place at advantage being adaptable. Um, the 25% most prolonged periods, and over the last five million years, these are the periods of them, the time periods of them. And I thought, well, okay, what do we know in the hominin fossil record uh, from Africa specifically, because this is an African climate variability model of alternating uh, climate variability, what goes on in human evolutionary history. And the result is that almost everything that's interesting. Um, happens to go on there. We've run a whole series of uh, null models tests whereby, um, which randomizes evolutionary events um, over 5,000 iterations to get p-values to look at statistically um, the, correla the correlation, the association of first appearance uh, first appearances in the uh, fossil and archaeological record. There's no reason that we've been able to find as to why, um, through random chance, that the first appearance datums would be associated with prolonged periods of high climate variability. But at a p-value of about 0 0.007 for both lineages as well as adaptive history, um, there is a correlation with these prolonged periods of high climate variability. The first appearance that's known so far of Australopithecus Paranthropus and Homo, the three major genera in human evolutionary history, um, are uh, in high, uh, pe prolonged periods of high climate variability. Every major change in technology from the, the first stone tools, Old Awan, to Acheulean, to the Middle Stone Age and Late Stone Age, are embedded in periods of high climate, prolonged high climate variability. Um, and the two major dispersal events, the dispersal of the genus Homo and the dispersal of Homo sapiens, also happen to be in the, a prolonged period of high climate variability. Uh, and so this has led a number of uh, my colleagues and, and, and I to think of adaptability as being really the new theme, the new overarching theme in our story of our evolutionary history no longer a matter of what was our ancestral environment and how is there this dissonance between us today and what our evolutionary history has been, but rather through a process of uh, adaptation um, to high climate variability, to high environmental and ecological dis uh, uh, disparity and, and instability, that the adaptability, mean, meaning the ability of an organism to endure change in the environment, to thrive in novel environments, to spread to new habitats, and to respond to new ways to the surroundings, makes sense as a property 
of members of the genus Homo, including the last remaining example that we have of, uh, of the genus. And so I'll just run through this quickly. This is something that I showed earlier about these major milestones in human evolutionary history. And we can now understand these adaptive benefits not in terms of the adaptation to a, an African savanna of a grassland environment or of an ice age, but rather in terms of the ways in which they enhance the adaptability of, um, of human ancestors and relatives um, in the ways that uh, I just defined, including in this last time period here of uh, being able to expand the range of adaptive options of the species, the ability to have symbolic behavior, including uh, the most complex version of that, uh, language abilities, and so on. And so I've been interested in looking at this last period of um, human evolutionary history in our fieldwork at Allergisile. And uh, what we find in, at, in southern Kenya is that this period of hand axes gives way, and we've documented this in the last 10 years of our excavations, by 320,000 years ago to totally new innovations, what's called the Middle Stone Age, a much smaller and more mobile technology. Um, stone uh, material that no longer comes from just a few kilometers away, but is apparently exchanged with distant groups a hundred kilometers away, coming in en masse as large blocks of material, not chipped along the way by a single group, but actually jumping space. We think this is evidence of social exchange and networking. Um, we also have the first, and this is the same scale as, the, as, as this up here, we have the first projectile points, preparation of the uh, core, such that with one strike of the hammerstone, this repetitive manufacturing of these tiny triangular points that actually show impact damage on the tip. And the world's never been the same since. Uh, and also evidence from these same archaeological sites at 320,000 years ago of coloring material, the world's oldest pigments, um, which is often seen as the roots of human symbolic ability. Not only that, but in addition to these changes in early human behavior, we see a total, a real turnover in the fauna from the extinction of those large-bodied lawnmowers that I talked about and the modernization of uh, hippos and pigs and baboons and, and zebras and elephants to the living species of African wildlife that are able to adjust. They have smaller bodies and are able to adjust much more effectively uh, to, uh, to environmental changes. So the problem here is that there is a big erosional surface between here 500,000 years ago and 320,000 years ago, excuse me, in the Allurgisile Basin. How are we going to solve this? It wasn't by launching a spaceship uh, or a, a rocket. Uh, it was by doing drilling. We went to this flat area of the Allurgisile Basin after doing some seismic reflection studies showing that we could get sediments down below the ground surface. We got this drill core that uh, Vlad mentioned in his uh, introduction where we got actually 216 meters of sediment at two drilling sites. It's a wonderful core. Uh, we have next uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday a group of 28 scientists from around the world who are studying various aspects of the core coming to the Smithsonian to bring all of the data together uh, for the first time. Uh, but um, this is at the sampling workshop in Minnesota. Um, and um, this just shows you a little bit of the core, and um, it's absolutely wonderful, showing transitions from land to lake. For much the last 500,000 years, a, um, a seasonal record of wet and dry seasons. Uh, in 216 meters of core, we have over 150 datable volcanic ashes. Uh, so we don't have to have an age model. We're actually going to have ages for these various climate transitions. And so um, we also have the times of the earliest Middle Stone Age. So just let me finish here then by saying that we see innovations near the origin of, the, of Homo sapiens. This is a timeline from 280,000 years to 40,000 years ago from a classic article published in 2000. 
a whole variety of innovations in human behavior around the time and just before and just after the time of the origin of our species about 200,000 years ago. Our work at Allurgosciele is extending some of these back to 320,000 years ago. And this is emblematic of increasing innovation, trade, wider social networks, complex symbolic activity, language, complex thinking and planning beyond what we can see in earlier hominins. And this, I would say, represents a greater capacity to adjust to new environments. And so my point here in conclusion is that this narrative, the overarching narrative of human origins, has become much more one a matter of um, uh, adaptability. We are now in this phase of what we call the Anthropocene, where we see for the very first time a new, really a new experiment in humans bringing their altering tendencies, their ability to alter the world. Um, which we can trace back in time, the origin of fire, the origin of stone tool making, of modifying the environment, the origin of shelters, building things, the origin, of course, in our own species of planting and changing landscapes. And we have been planting and building and burning things ever since, uh, way back in time. That we see these altering tendencies interacting not with a static world, but with a, in a world that has an inherently uh, dynamic and unstable uh, situation about it. And I think that our sources of resilience and adaptability will need to come into full play as we go forward into the future. Thanks very much. Excellent. I believe there might be some questions around here. Mm -hmm. Would you like to start? Okay. Yes. And yeah. Hey. I was wondering, okay, I have two questions. First one is, if, uh, I was wondering if this uh, variability could also affect other species mm. in the past of, the, of our planet. Right. And the second question is, <coughs> from an uh, astrological perspective, it's possible to say that variability is mandatory, okay? Maybe it's, it's very important to the arisal of um, an intelligence, or a, a complex organism in a Right, right, right. That's a, the second one isn't a question. It's a great comment, and I agree with it. Um, the, uh, the matter of affecting other organisms is absolutely essential. I didn't have much time to present that here, but if you look at some of those high variability phases where we have really good faunal records, um, from uh, East Africa, that you do see uh, revamping of those faunas during that time. Some of it's subtle in terms of uh, larger changes in relative abundance of species, but other times, uh, like in a period of time when hominins were beginning uh, to expand out of Africa uh, between 1.9 and 1.7 million years ago, where you actually have a major turnover in the East African fauna, um, extinction of species, uh, as well as um, uh, new, uh, new appearances of lineages. Uh, so the, yes, the fauna is a critical thing to also bring into, into play here. Uh, humans are not evolving in isolation from the rest of the eco ecosystems. Uh, with regard to the matter of um, uh, it's, it's inherent in life, um, all I can say to that is that um, I've, I've been asked twice to be a keynote speaker at astrobiology conferences, and I've been wondering why in the world would I be asked to do that? And it's because of, I think the point you're making is that there is a great deal of interest in the idea that um, it's not just a matter of, I mean, use this strange metaphor of what happens if life uh, originates in a warm little pond. My question is what happens when the pond dries up? is that there has to be some inherent ability, resilience, or adaptability that's, that's part of the evolutionary process that can be built into to organisms. And so I think that that is critical. And I think that with regard to intelligence, cognition, that that is one of the expressions in the forms of life that we know here on Earth, uh, whereby plasticity has its greatest expression. There you go. Yeah, so I'm I, the view of, I've been getting, I think this is fascinating, the view I've been getting here is sort of a very deterministic view of the mm. process. And if I think about it, uh, as far as I understand, uh, human beings are the, and, and then all the other our cousins, are the only ones that have developed a technology and sort of a culture, what we would recognize as a culture, throughout you know the billions of years of evolution. And mm. happened only in East Africa, 
which is an area where there is a lot of client variability in there has been, but it's not the area of greatest client variability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, if variability is such a determining factor in generating culture and intelligence, why didn't this happen in equatorial uh, East, the East Pacific, say, mm -hmm. in uh, you know, Western South America, which is where the biggest client variability is? Yeah, it has been for a while. I mean, why aren't why don't we have a la, uh, you know llamas in being you know? Yeah, that's a good. It's, is, it's, is there something about us, or was it? Purely random. No, no, it's not something about us, except for the fact that we happen to belong to a, a an, an, a biological order within a biological class that is primates within mammals that happen to have um, a tendency toward uh, an evolvability of cognitive functions of, of large brains, for example. Um, you have birds that are incredibly adaptable, um, but they use their wings as part of their ways of, of adjusting to environmental change, um, as opposed to having a situation where the earliest primates 55 million years ago, certainly back to 65 million years ago, but cer certainly we have good examples by 55 million years ago of being able to manipulate the environment. Okay, and being able to, and over the course of, of primate evolutionary history, not just within the great apes, not just within monkeys, but even within lemurs and lower, lower as we call lower primates, I hate that sort of term, but, um, but um, that we have uh, uh, evidence of the capacity to increase brain size and cognitive functioning. And so basically what the, the, the problem here is that starting conditions, the initial conditions is that you have, through a diverse of great apes in the Miocene. The Miocene at around 11 million years ago, say um, uh, 14, 13 million years ago to about 9 million years ago was the heyday of the great apes. And the efflorescence of great apes was in Europe, not in Africa, but with increases in seasonality and overall climate uh, cooling that occurred in the Miocene and expressed very well in European record, Eurasian records that the, um, the ability to move was the main ways in which those great apes were able to adjust to environmental changes such that the great apes ended up being equatorial, okay? With one group um, that gave rise to gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans being in Africa and the orangutans being in Southeast Asia. And it turned out that um, Africa turned out to be a place of high climate variability where there was this manipulative tendency toward the ability to, to in, increase brain size and have the genetic variation to do that um, in that particular area. It's a very complex answer to the question because it is this interaction between I don't know if I'd call it deterministic aspects because there are many things that are indeterminate about it, uh, about the relationship between climate change and evolution. But climate change is what we're pointing to as, 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 a, as a, in climate variability as a critical factor in it all. But the other part of it is what's the starting point? So we need primates. You need primates, absolutely you need primates. You need great apes and you need them to get to in the conditions of the contingencies of uh, biogeographic history to have them end up in, in, in Africa. In terms of genetic variability, um, was there in the Rift Valley more radiation exposure so there would be more errors and some of them being successful errors? I haven't a clue. Um, I, don't, I don't know necessarily that that would be the, um, that would be the case. You know, one thing that's in interesting to keep in mind, and actually one of the things that I didn't really have a uh, show here, but let's look at these guys. That the, um, the flip side of being the, the last of, a, um, um, of, of, the, uh, of the hominins is that human evolutionary history has the other side of, it, of adaptability. That's a heck of a lot of extinction. These all represent uh, forms of life in our own evolutionary history, much more closely related to us than chimpanzees are, that no longer exist on Earth. Their, their ways of life do not exist on Earth, even though some of them were ancestors, some of them were side branches. 
And that, I think, gives you pause about this fine tension between adaptability and between thriving and decline, between survival and extinction. That is part of this, if I may call it, more no a novel picture of our evolutionary history rather than a march of progress through time. Uh, and so um, the Neanderthals, for example, which is on the, uh, the upper uh, right, um, were very sophisticated. Um, they uh, largely evolved in um, ice age fluctuations, but we have from the archaeological record evidence that during the advances of glaciers, they went south, so to speak. No, I mean literally south. They went into um, Iberia and into, uh, into Italy, and then re-expanded during interglacial times. They were the most bodily, the most cold adapted species, the most habitat specialists that we see in our evolutionary history. They had brains as large as those of fossil Homo sapiens in Africa. Uh, they, had, they made tools that were not too different from those of early, uh, earliest Homo sapiens. And so why didn't they survive? Well, what's really, really interesting is that um, during one of the Ice Age periods, about 40,000 years ago, 40 to 35,000 years ago, um, they went south. And when a slight interglacial condition, an interstadial condition, as it would be called, occurred, when they might have moved north again, re-expanded, Homo sapiens with African body proportions had already moved in. African body proportions? Well, what did they have? They had this buffer of culture around themselves. They had this ability to exchange resources with groups 500 kilometers away. If there's a bad time here, we'll, we'll go to our allies 500 kilometers away, or maybe we'll raid them. Who knows exactly what's going on there? Um, and they had uh, things like sewing needles. They had in innovations, the very first er, the sewing needles by which they could knit tightly fitting clothing. Neanderthals just had punch alls that they could punch holes in clothing and make loosely fitting clothing. And so there was a competitive advantage to Homo sapiens in that area. There's no killing field. There are no killing fields that we know of. There are no evidence of warfare between them. Um, but there certainly was a competitive advantage, and that competitive advantage was one of um, adaptability. And so what I would suggest is that I don't know about genetic variability and its, its possible causes in Africa. But what I do know is that the dry and wet variability in Africa enabled or at least allowed populations to hunker down and to adjust to what comes. Whereas an ice age in Europe, you pretty basically have got to move and go back. And that's what the Neanderthals did until Homo sapiens expanded across the world beginning about 60,000 years ago, not only going by 40,000 years ago into the colder areas than Neanderthals could stand, but also for the first time into hotter and wetter and drier environments than any earlier human could go into. And that sums it up about where we are in terms of being a global species. More questions? What's over there, anything else to me? Hey, um, I wondered if you could flesh out the, these periods of, like drill down into a period of high climate variability and give us a sense of what that would have looked like on human time scales. Um, right. You know, is it something one would see over one's lifetime, or are we talking thousands of years? Or? Um, yeah. In fact, literally, um, after next week, I'll be able to tell you exactly what drilling down looks in, like <laughs> into it when we hold this workshop about one of those uh, that will focus in on one of those high climate variability time periods from 356,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago. Uh, a really very long time period in which many of these changes related to the origin of our species um, occurs. Um, what we understand at this stage is that um, not necessarily any, any one individual at any in their in his or her lifetime would see the whole range of change between from high seasonality to low seasonality that would have been expressed over longer periods of time the point of this idea of variability selection is that the gene pool of which all of those organisms over time are a part of 
um, does extend across a period that's long enough so that ancestors and descendants see very different seasonal templates of the environment and see very different environments themselves, landscape resources. And, and the ability within that it can accumulate, the hypothesis is, that it can accumulate within that gene pool is such that the ability to adjust to those changes is ultimately built in. And so I don't know if that answers your question. It's, it, you know, but as I say that we have this wonderful opportunity whereby season of the year, for much of the last 500,000 years, we believe that we're going to be able to actually give you a season by season blow. That might take 50 years for us to do, <laughs> uh, but a season by season blow of, of what um, the climate variability and how it's structured seasonally into these longer periods of high and low climate variability look like. But we're not there yet. So last question from Mick. I'm curious, that it seemed like you were suggesting that the radiation to global scale population happened very, very quickly once it began. And right. Is, have I understood that correctly? Yes, yes. Is that also, is that common with other types of organisms or just unique to humans? No, I don't think it's unique to humans. I think if you look at some of the um, examples that are known in the, um, the, the geological and the fossil record, uh, the expansion of the um, of the genus Equus uh, around uh, 2.6, 2.5 million years ago. Um, yeah, that took about um, 200,000 years to get from North America to Africa. Um, but that's really pretty pretty quick relative to the time scale of the uh, uh, of those lineages of how long they uh, they persisted. Um, and so it wasn't just sort of a uh, process that was. Um, graduated over the course of a species or a lineage's um, evolutionary history. It's, they tend to be much more abrupt. Mm. And do they happen together or are they, they, they you know, those kind of things? That's a really good question. I mean, I've been trying to, to study this and have had um, a graduate student or two uh, trying to study this with regard to looking at faunas in China, looking at faunas in India, looking at faunas in uh, the Near East with regard to the earliest um, dispersal of the genus Homo. And what we find at this stage looks like with earliest Homo erectus that there are African species that get to the Near East. There are then species from there that make it into India. There are then species that there, that from there that make it into uh, Eastern Asia. There are always fellow travelers, but the only one that makes it all the way across as a single species is Homo erectus. And so human beings, even back then, those experiments in being human, also needed to be part of ecological communities moving. But it looked like even early on, we have this expression of adaptability in Homo erectus that was greater than in other organisms. Excellent. Well, let's thank Rick.